welcome to another interview at Room for Discussion. The word of the day today is capitalism. It's a commonly used word that takes on a whole range of different meanings depending on who you're talking to. Well, today we're talking to Branko Milanovic, former lead economist at the research department of the World Bank and now a visiting professor at the City University of New York. For him, capitalism means, amongst other things, the title of his book, Capitalism Alone, The Future of the System That Rules the World. And we'll be going into this book in today's interview. Mr. Milanovic is an expert on capitalism's much maligned sibling, inequality. Specifically, he is focused on in income inequality. He has researched income inequality extensively and has written multiple books about the developments of global income inequality in recent years. We're going to be asking him about how inequality relates to the two systems of capitalism that he describes in his book, what trends we see and what we can expect in the future. So, whether you think capitalism is God's gift to earth or the source of all evil in the world, with any luck, after our interview with Mr. Milanovic, you'll have a better idea of the past, present and future of the system that rules the world. Thank you, Mr. Milanovic, for being here today. We really appreciate it. And well, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. It is, it is a pleasure. I mean, all, despite the fact, of course, that we have to do it all by virtually, but it's still better than nothing. Yeah, usually we have our interviews on the stage with, with our great couch, and uh, <laughs> today we're, we're here. Um, we would like to discuss uh, inequality as a research subject uh, before we, that's, that's the first thing. Over the last two decades or so, we've seen uh, a regained interest um, in the study subject of inequality. Um, many famous and important economists have published on this, this topic. Why has the study of inequality regained interest? You know, it, it is a good question. I, uh, I'm actually planning to, to write a new book where actually I would discuss why inequality has not been a topic between probably 1960 and, and 2000. Uh, but to answer, which actually I think has to do with the political situation in the Western countries and uh, the the fact that inequality was then either until 1980s at least it was either declining or um, was stable now why did inequality become a big topic today i think that we really have to go back to the to the financial crisis it actually started as you know in the in the rich countries if you take the us or uk or or sweden or the netherlands it actually started rising in the 1980s but it did not achieve any level of prominence in terms of research nor popular interest that it has today. And I think what happened with the uh, financial crisis was that uh, suddenly many people, especially in the United States, realized, particularly for the middle class, that they have not actually had a very substantial real growth over a long time. As you know, the, the American med uh, median wage has been stagnant now for 40 years. Now, a lot of that was covered by greater participation of women in labor force, so, so that increased actually income of the family, and also by the ability to borrow, which of course came to an abrupt end uh, with the financial crisis. And then at the same time, uh, the realization set in that people at the very top have done extremely well. So I think it is that, uh, it is that combination of the abrupt stop in growth of the middle class plus realization of the fact that the, the cost to some extent of the crisis and the, and the, the gains over the long term have not been shared uh, in any proportional manner. Uh, I'm not talking about just manner because when we study inequality, we study it, I think empirically. So it is actually simply not proportional. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually led to the increase of interest in inequality. Okay. Uh, then, of course, you had all many of the movements as, of course, Occupied was quite famous and then Indignados in Spain and so forth. And I, I, I still that was the, the turning point, in my opinion, uh, from that point onward, we actually have had inequality as a big topic. Yeah. So it, you uh, mentioned the, the, the middle class and how the rich has uh, developed their income, which you also uh, published an article on the, the, the very famous uh, elephant uh, chart. Uh, which is also called the, the, the sexiest chart in economics. <laughs> um, but what I, what I think that I hear is that um, it's, it's more of a holistic approach to, to the division um, instead of 
poverty research, which was more prominent uh, before the financial crisis. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah. How how do yeah. you is is that also the, the the big difference that it's more of a holistic approach? I think it's actually yes. It's a more holistic. Actually, if you technically, even if you look compare poverty research to inequality, obviously they are cousins. They are very close to each other. They use often very I mean the same sources of data, whether it is you know household surveys or fiscal. Although fiscal are of course much less used for poverty simply because fiscal doesn't cover the entire distribution. Mm -hmm. But they are very close to each other. Now, inequality is more holistic in the sense that first technically takes into account the entire distribution, whereas the poverty does really truncation. When you do poverty, you look at the, at the people who are below some level that you have defined as, as being poor. Inequality by definition takes everybody into account. Yeah. It is more holistic and of course it has many more implications for other things, you know, uh, Inequality, you can argue, and actually people have written papers about that, is, is linked to obviously social mobility, is linked to political developments, has many other implications. Uh, poverty is more constrained. Uh, uh, it's not because, for example, of US poverty is 12% or 14% or 18% that you're likely to have some tremendous effect on, on on the political system but then on the other hand if you have lots of very rich people who are funded who are funding political campaigns or different candidates or who are actually having control over the media or who are monopolists that would have really a, a big impact so i think of course yeah, i agree with you i mean inequality is a more holistic topic uh, maybe some of self-serving that would say it's a more important topic mm -hmm. but not saying that of course reduction of poverty in some sense of ethical requirement is obviously the the most important one in the uh, we would have clearly prefer a world where poverty would be would be at zero you know so is that, is that, is it that, is uh, it is true um is that also your personal motivation because you have uh, dedicated decades of your life to uh, inequality research uh, is, is this part of your, your personal intrinsic motivation? Yeah, I think so. Actually, you know, obviously I have worked on inequality much more. I worked also on poverty. Uh, they're related, they're close topics, yeah. but I was more, well, I'm not sure if I'm misusing this word, but I was more passionate about inequality, maybe for the reasons that uh, you mentioned about being more holistic and, uh, and because it has uh, um, repercussions to, as I said before, to many of the phenomena. And on the other hand, it's itself sort of uh, influenced by many phenomena. Again, there is a little difference with poverty. Poverty may be influenced by some, you know, topic, I mean, some changes in the variables. I mean, if you, you look, for example, at the top marginal rate, whether it's the marginal rate is, you know, 40% or 60%, it's not going to affect poverty per se. But you know it does affect inequality. So there are lots of um, uh, lots of economic variables that would actually affect inequality. And when talking about inequality, we tend to separate income inequality from wealth inequality. Uh, the latter has recently, I think, much more come to the fore in public debate with Piketty's work and the Warren and Sanders campaigns from uh, campaigning for a wealth tax. But we'll see wealth inequality and income inequality are very related. They feed back into each other. So to what extent is it even useful to separate these as issues? I think it is useful to separate them simply because wealth as a variable is, is different from, from income. Uh, they do feed into each other, but normally, and I think actually I almost, I cannot really think of an exception, wealth inequality is much greater. Uh, so wealth inequality is indeed extremely important. The, the data come from different sources. I think we should keep them separate in a conceptual sense. And also when it comes to taxation and to uh, attempts, which of course started, as you mentioned, with PKT, but also with Tony Atkinson, um, to either tax wealth or to redistribute wealth. And actually that's a topic that, um, of course, I addressed also in, in um, uh, Capitalism Alone, uh, uh, decon what I call deconcentration of wealth. So I think these are really topics that topics that are close, but again distinct from uh, from income inequality. Yeah, um, that's that's very interesting. Uh, 
do you think that a lot of people forget that uh, income inequality is derived from, from two sources, capital income and, and, and labor income, and that most people think that it's only about labor income? Yeah, I think it's a huge mistake, and I think it did goes back to what they said in the beginning. Um, I think one of the reasons why income inequality was really neglected between 19, I suppose, approximately 1960 to 2000 was because um, for the reasons that I mentioned before, the in income inequality has not been rising, but also because the work was done entirely on wage inequality. Now, wage inequality is an important component of income inequality. But I, it is important to realize that when we study wage inequality, we are studying it from the point of view of labor economics. So we are really basically looking at the returns to education, and we are actually looking that over the population of wage earners. Now, the two things are really uh, far apart sometimes. You study wage inequality across the population of wage earners, but you have no idea who is partnering with who. And that's, of course, quite important. If two high wage earners partner with each other, then obviously inequality would tend to be increased. Secondly, you have no idea what are capital incomes. And that meant that basically capital incomes and wealth inequality have not been studied or have not been studied sufficiently at all. Uh, in that sense, because this work is quite important because he really re-emphasized um, uh, capital as one of the, I mean, important contributors to overall inequality mm -hmm. because although as you know capital in a share of total income is less significantly less than labor it is much more unequally distributed so it does contribute quite a lot yeah um uh, so that was actually james mead did of course work on that in the 1970s and uh, uh so that actually was uh, was it, it did exist the work existed but really it was much less uh, prominent than it is now. Yeah. So I, I think that conceptually we really have to, to to make a clear distinction between the work which is really driven by labor economics and the work which is really driven by the interest in inequality between individuals, which then has an uh, impact also on social mobility and equality of opportunities and all of that, which wage that inequality as such does not. Let's, let's talk about that more uh, a bit later. We'd like to start on your book right now. You recently published a book um, called Capitalism Alone, where you uh, state that capitalism is the only mode of production left on our planet, hence the name Capitalism Alone. But there are still areas in the world where there is not really a wage labor system uh, or the means of productions are owned uh, privately. Uh, so how do you come to this conclusion that capitalism is the only mode of production we have left? Well, you know, it, it is an empirical thing, actually. Of course, what you allude to and many people ask me is the issue of China. Uh, I don't think that we have any debates whether the U.S. is a capitalist country or Sweden is a capitalist country or Spain is a capitalist country or Russia is a capitalist country. But the issue starts with China and China, of course, and Vietnam in particular, because uh, people say, well, look, these countries are not capitalist because essentially the the party which is in power there uh, has an ideology that is socialist and they call of course themselves social themselves socialist market economy and uh, i think more recently when the conflict with china sort of got exacerbated if you look at the american press it, they're actually starting more and more to speak of china and use the word communist and all of that now, empirically, if you define capitalism as uh, Marx first and then Max Weber did in a very sort of a, a economical way with the majority of the means of, of production owned privately, with the fact that there is the wage, that the labor is hired as wage labor, but it's legally free, and that uh, decentralized, that coordination is decentralized, I think actually China, and I show the numbers in the book, actually fits all the three all three criteria uh i will not go through all of them but clearly uh if you look at the uh, but, but employment like, uh, the state North sector Korea. employment is relatively small it's actually when i say relatively small it's over, uh, less than 10 percent and that employment is at the level at which many west european countries including france were in the 1980s 
and the last point and the, uh, the value added produ uh, produced in the state sector is about 20 percent which again is very similar to the you know european countries in the um, in the in the 1980s so that, that my argument is purely empirical that actually that according to the sort of objective called the uh, criteria china is indeed a capitalist country but even if, if, if China is, is a capitalist country, what about countries like North Korea, for example? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, you know, obviously North Korea. I, I actually don't have the data. Uh, you know, North Korea is clearly an, an outlier. I don't think anybody be. has the data for North Korea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't have the data. You know, another possibility, and actually, again, I don't want to go into the uh, such. I mean, relatively. How should I say unimportant countries discussion like Cuba also, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but Cuba has actually, it seems to me, my impression is that it has moved much more towards the, the Chinese type of uh, organization, if you will. But um, again, I don't have the numbers and uh, I'm not insisting that necessarily Cuba and North Korea are, are capitalists. So I'm quite agnostic on that. Okay. And within capitalism, you distinguish uh, between two types. We're going to go into these and the trends we see and some of the characteristics in more detail later. But for now, just at the start, could you very briefly define these types? Well, in, in the book, the two types, one is liberal slash meritocratic capitalism, where the U.S. is used really as a key examples, simply because I'm most familiar with U.S. data. And, uh, you know, U.S. data are quite plentiful and they actually maybe uh, describe that system more powerfully than than other you know other countries um and the other the the second system is the system of political capitalism where china plays analogous role to the role that the u.s plays in the first now what are the uh, uh definitions i already defined capitalism so i will not repeat that but what is specific about meritocratic and liberal is that the two terms come directly from roles John Rawls, who used them in a slightly different context. He used them in the context of defining uh, uh, what he called meritocratic and then liberal equality. Now, meritocratic in Rawls's terminology simply means equality before the law. In mm -hmm. other words, that everybody in technically can achieve any position in life regardless of his or her background. So in other words, we are not talking about the society of estates or of, uh, uh, you know, serfdom or of caste, where by being born in whatever, you know, either caste or a social order, you are actually either limited or you have, you know, monopoly over certain positions. So meritocratic really in today's terms, what, what it, it really does not mean much. It simply means practically every country in the world is organized according to the principles that there is no legal discrimination in that respect. Mm -hmm. And then uh, more importantly, liberal is defined as a system, and of course in my case, I mean, liberal capitalism, is a system that tries to adjust in, for inequality and opportunity in two ways. One, by taxing inheritance so that actually differences in the amount of capital that different individuals have as they are growing up becomes diminished. And secondly, it's a system that tries to open up education to everybody, which means to equalize again opportunities or chances in life by having public education. So these are really the two characteristics that, uh, that uh, roles uh, introduces, and that's how I also define liberal capitalism as a capitalism, not to repeat, but capitalism. capitalism that goes after uh, reduction of inequality of opportunity through the reduction of inequality in two factors of production, through inheritance for capital and through opening up of the public schools to education and skills. Uh, and the definition of political capitalism comes from Max Weber. It's a definition where essentially the, the office, uh, political office, is used for uh, private uh, gain, if you will, and where actually political uh, power is important in order to acquire economic power. In other words, what the political capitalism has as its specificum, I would say, 
is the use of political power to reach certain economic objectives. Okay. And we can talk about that later, so I'll just stop yeah. there. But you can also see that liberal capitalism might be doing the opposite, use the use of economic power to achieve political objectives. Yeah, we noticed that as well. Yeah, yeah we'll talk about uh, that. We'll talk about that indeed. Um, well, to say in, in, in Weber's lingo, uh, th these two are ideal types, and uh, we'd now like to discuss the, the, right. the first one you described, uh, liberal meritocratic capitalism. Um, in your book, you state that there are several systematic features that lead to inequality. Um, we would like to discuss a few of them, if that's okay. Over the last decades, um, we've seen uh, an increase in the aggregate capital share of the national income, meaning that a larger proportion of the national income uh, consists out of uh, interest payments, dividends, uh, profits, realized yep. capital gains. Um, where it used to be the assumption that it, this was quite stable, we now see that it's increasing. Is this problematic? Yeah, that was actually the beginning of my sort of, I think, six systemic features yeah. of inequality in, in the liberal capitalism. It, it starts essentially, as you were saying, it's by, by the rising part of the overall pie of national income mm -hmm. going up for capital. And I, why is it important to realize how, I mean, is that if capital were, let's suppose, distributed in proportion to your income, so that actually we might have different overall incomes and, you know, I may be richer or poorer than you in terms of both capital and labor, uh, and inequality can be high. Still, in that case, the rising share of capital would not increase inequality in relative sense because our incomes would increase both percentage-wise the same. The problem with the rising share of capital in total national income is that it actually automatically translates in higher interpersonal inequality because of concentration of capital ownership or wealth, if you will, also in the hands of the few and in the hands of those few who are rich. So this is the problem with the rising capital share. And if you believe, as some people believe, that actually we will still see even more of that because of automation, robotics, and other things, then of course we really have a kind of an open door to an increase in inequality due to the rising capital share. And finally, then if you want to combat that increase in inequality, then you have to start with distribution in a big way of the current income which if the endowments were more equally distributed, you would not have to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, interesting. Um, would, would you say that an inheritance tax would then uh, be a, a good thing in, in, in fixing this issue? You know, uh, uh, the, the six, uh, the six uh, uh, different uh, uh, systemic inequalities go in a certain I think logical order. So yeah. I will <laughs> obviously we will not cover all of that now. I mean, after all, people need also, also to read the book uh, and uh, to buy it and to read it. Um, but uh, it starts with, as we're saying, with the rising share of capital. Then it it follows from that that you know, there are a few other things, and I think including the fact that actually that we have more and more people who are rich, both in terms of labor and capital income. We have more of the assortative mating, which gives greater advantage to the children of the of the labor and capital rich, and we have the control of the rich by of, uh, by, of the political process by the rich. So all of these elements dynamically have a sort of a, a component which I think is very important, and which is reduction of social mobility. So it is, I think, within that context that one should also look at what you asked me. It's about um, the uh, taxation of inheritance. And the taxation of inheritance, I think, in, in, John Ro in Rawls's approach, in Atkinson's, and even in Piketty, although he talks more about wealth, not about inheritance, the objective is really reduction, uh, increase in social mobility. And so we have really to look at that dynamically. Why do we do that? And I think that's the, you know, the way to, to, to look at also at income inequality much more dynamically than we do now. And um, inheritance tax was one of the, the methods of um, trying to get past this problem of, of high concentration of capital, trying to increase mobility. 
Well, can you can you list the other two? Just because, yes, I, I think, and you say this in the book as well, high concentration of capital is something you see in pretty much all types of capitalism ever. And there's, you know, a certain inherent intuitiveness to it. You know, capital accumulation is intrinsic to uh, to capitalism and you, you need wealth to acquire wealth. So is this really a feature that you can solve or is it something that we have to accept as part of capitalism? You know, this is the feature that we have become so uh, sort of... Um, adjusted and conditioned to to take it as granted because historically it is true that uh, even in pre-capitalist formations uh, you had a very high concentration of wealth in the hands of the few and what was of course important is that these few were at the top of the income distribution Um, let me just say that the fact that something is in the hands of the few does not necessarily mean that it's inequality producing or increasing. I mean, think of the analog to the high concentration of of capital income is high concentration of unemployment benefits. They are also very highly concentrated, but they are not highly concentrated in the hands of the rich. They are highly concentrated among people who are poor. So here we have high concentration plus high concentration among the rich. So that has been really a feature. If you go to Athens and Rome, which are not capitalist societies, you would have it and you would have it now. So we really have sort of inbuilt tendency to believe that this is something totally normal. But it need not be normal, or at least it need not be as concentrated as it is now. So I think actually there are several uh, ways, including the taxation of inheritance, but also a few others like that I mentioned in the book that were also mentioned by, by other people. It is, of course, worker ownership, like in the in the U.S., it exists employee employee stock ownership plans, uh, different advantages for small investors. All of these methods could be used to reduce concentration of capital ownership. So I don't think that we should really give up immediately. And I I, I also I'm somewhat optimistic that actually I think that in a maybe half a century or a century we might look at our sort of uh, uh, obsession or a belief that we cannot affect the distribution of capital with some puzzlement, because I I think we we can't do that. Okay. One of of the big issues that also leads to this higher concentration of uh, capital is that the the, the rate of return of capital for for richer people is higher than those for uh, the middle class. So, for instance, most of the wealth for the middle class is uh, in their house, which is usually highly leveraged and very undiversified, whereas the wealth of very rich people um, as, as a higher rate of return. Uh, is there something? That's true, actually. Uh, there is actually people distinguish between two different uh, uh, types of higher return for the wealthy. One is that the composition of wealth, as you said, for the rich is different from the composition of wealth from the middle class. And I, when I say middle class, it really actually includes everybody from the 30th percentile to the 95th percentile, because it's really it's only at the very top 5% and we are talking about rich countries, uh, where the financial assets are really concentrated. Uh, So compositionally, they are different. And if the returns to financial assets are higher than the returns on housing, then, of course, you have an an exacerbated inequality in wealth. But then secondly, even when you look at per dollar of financial capital, it often turns out, although we really have very few studies that I'm aware of, but among the ones that we have, it turns out that the return on each individual dollar of the rich is higher than individual dollar of less rich. And the reason what people have adduced is because simply there are certain, uh, there are first costs of entry, which are much higher. If you have only $1,000 to invest, the cost of entry is going to be high. Nobody is going to you know, spend their time giving you much advice or diversification of where you should invest because it's not worthwhile their time. But if you show up with 1 million, then of course they would do that because they would get a percentage which would be sizable. Uh, so, you know, there are some arguments why what actually recently reread that part, for example, in, in James Smith's book, which he calls positive feedback. So there are these positive feedbacks that feed inequality in wealth. Uh, and then, of course, the, 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 the differential rate of return is one of them. Yeah, so it's also due to, like, economies of scale, uh, in a sense. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, 
when when talking about like the long run, we see that you know people get very rich and and prominent in society as well. So they are able to generate quite a high degree of influence over the political process. Um, you uh, once said that I, I, to become the I president of the United States, that you either have to be a billionaire, be backed by a billionaire, or pretend to be a billionaire. Uh, and we see with Donald Trump that he's give, had a big tax cut um, and uh, profiting from them themselves and the very rich. Uh, can, can we say that this is kind of a plutocratic tendency? Do we, do we see uh, meritocratic liberal states um, floating away from a democracy for and by the people? I, I do think actually that that's that's the case and uh, uh, again I, I if if you look at the empirical work that was done uh, in the US and then I've seen recently in Germany as well uh, we actually have maybe I think for the first time in history we have uh, a sort of an empirical confirmation that the political power is not equally or nearly equally distributed across the income distribution. In other words, in the work that was done uh, by Larry Bartels and by Gillens, you see that the topics which matter to the rich are much more frequently part of the discussion and they are being debated or acted upon in legislative bodies like the Cong like Congress in the United States or, or uh, you know, parliaments in Europe. So that uh, shows to me that really the, the, the wealth by itself has an influence on what are the topics, what are the legislative decisions. But of course, wealth has another effect and that effect of course is funding of political campaigns, finding the candidates and of course then, you know, bankrolling the candidates that would be actually, uh, you know, basically fighting for your interests. And I mentioned that in the book, it's actually striking that the concentration of uh, political campaign contributions is something which is probably the most concentrated variable that I've seen ever. Yes. You, I, I really, it's very difficult to have a concentration which is beyond that because what is happening, the wealth is very heavily concentrated, but political campaigns are even more concentrated because they are they they are actually uh, money comes from that select small group and it's very much in proportion or actually beyond the proportion of, of of personal wealth so in other words we have really we're talking there about a huge concentration of wealth uh, contributions and let me just say that people say okay so what do we make out of that but you know that it, to believe that it has no influence on the political process is essentially to argue that people who are contributing that money are somehow for once every four years they just become nuts and they just decide <laughs> okay i'm just going to give millions simply because i love to do that Coincidentally, obviously yeah. they have become rich by being extremely sharp businessmen or businesswomen who have actually fought for every dollar so they're not going to give that money like for nothing so yeah. there must be a return Otherwise, you really have to believe that you know, believe that in fairy tales that people are actually giving money away for no reason, and that's why I think actually we can pretty well argue that the role of policy or money in politics is is a huge and leads the society toward the plutocratic state. It seems like you're not very uh, altruistic in, in about this. What do you? What is your stance on philanthropy? Uh, well, it's not much better than what I said, actually, you know, philanthropy is uh, uh, people who actually argue that we can reduce state involvement and compensate that by philanthropy are, are basically wrong and self-serving because they actually might believe that what they are doing is right. But uh, the, the, the difference is that decisions on how money should be spent uh, when you have taxation are decisions that are done by in principle by all despite the fact what I just said that actually they are more and more done by the by the rich but in principle when you actually have taxation and decisions on social transfers or social investments they are done through the political process when uh, you have decision by the rich people that I want to fund this or that they really represent my own preferences 
So it could be that in some cases I feel very altruistic and I'm very keen on solving a given problem. But this is my own preference. So I'm actually imposing my own preference to the entire society. And I'm imposing that because, of course, I have money. Uh, but it's not really the same at all, even if the amounts were the same. $100 that were decided through taxation and social transfers to be spent on something are the result of the political process where, in principle, everybody is the same. $100 that I decide to give to somebody, whether it is a good project like you know eradication of a disease or something, is something that reflects my preference. And there is a fundamental difference between these two. Let's move back to the, the systemic features of uh, that you mentioned in your book, uh, specifically one on uh, homoplasia. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one because this is something that is specific to, to liberal meritocratic capitalism of the past kind of forty years, and it's it's when most of the, the people who own most of the capital also receive um, a high income from from labor. So if you go to your nineteenth century aristocrat, they had a large amount of wealth, but they pretty much just sat in a chair all day and did nothing. Whereas people who own all the capital now are high-functioning CEOs, doctors, lawyers, e etc. Um, how important and how yeah, unique is this this trait um, to liberal meritocratic capitalism? I, I think it's very important because really it really defines the modern capitalism or liberal capitalism compared to classical capitalism. In uh, just to kind of refresh people's memories, although I think many of them know that anyway, if when you read, for example, Ricardo or Marx, the, the entire sort of discussion is uh, based on functional income distribution, what economists call functional, which means that th th that was inequality is perceived as being a function of the type of income that you receive. So if you're a capitalist, we know that you are richer than a worker. And we know that when you're a capitalist, you receive 100% of your income through capital, or you can receive also from labor, but you're very unlikely to work as a hired uh, hired laborer. Yeah. I mean, take the example of Ricardo himself. You know, Ricardo's incomes came originally, of course, from banking and from investment, and then he, he became a land a landowner, and then of course he became a member of parliament when he bought the seat in the parliament. But he never worked as a as a hired hand. Mm -hmm. You know, and nobody who actually had significant amounts of money was doing that. Now the situation is different. You know, you now have, we talked of course before about this con huge concentration of wealth, but we also have people at the top and they're the same people who actually have high uh, uh, income from capital and also high income from labor. And that's actually a novelty. This, this did not exist in the most advanced countries in the 19th century. And, do you, do you think <laughs> and that, or did it exist in other countries? You, um, so that's that's a novel feature and it has, we can talk more about that, but it has also some uh, positive and also some negative sides. I, th I mean, focusing on a potential negative, so an argument we hear a lot is, you know, because of this this trait, you can say, you know, I, I'm rich, but I, I work really hard for it. And there is some, some truth in that. But, so do you think that this leads to more of an acceptance of excessive income inequality in, in society? Yes, I think there is some truth to that. Actually, empirically, again, we know that people at that high level of uh, both labor and capital income actually do work more than on, in general than people who actually have lower income. Um, for example, I think it was a very nice book that... Uh, the meritocracy trap by yeah. uh, the Daniel Markovich. And he mentions, he says actually the Stahanovites of today are really high, the, the, the top of the income distribution. They do work very hard. That makes it more difficult ethically to go and say, okay, we want really to tax you, uh, you know, exorbitantly, as you might actually say, we should have, or maybe we did tax people who in the past, let's suppose before, I mean, you know, the days before World War I or later, although the taxation rates obviously were not very high, but ethically you could say actually many of these people were basically only uh, coupon clippers. They did nothing actually, and they basically simply invested the money and had capital work for them. So in that sense, it makes it more difficult to actually to go and tax people who are rich because they also work hard. I think it's also true that we as observers, when we meet people, and I think it's an 
important point. We see that they're rich, but we cannot tell what part of their total incomes come from labor and what comes from capital. Let me give you an example. If we meet a person who is also rich, but whose entire income comes from capital, we have a more, let's say, judgmental approach because we say, well, this guy is very rich, he does nothing. But when we see somebody also rich, we cannot say, because he doesn't tell us, we cannot ask whether, you know, 80% of his income comes from capital and 20 from labor or the opposite. What we observe is that actually he or she is working quite hard. So that was, that makes, I think, the, uh, the how should I say, ethically much more difficult to, um, to be judgmental or to actually even implement policies that would be uh, very, uh, you know, uh, with high tax rates against people uh, whose incomes are high, but they come both from labor and capital. So yeah. the, the pros and cons are pretty pretty related then, because on the one hand, you say it's a pro that, you know, the wealthy are, they're at least working, you know, they are working in society, at least in theory, they are, you know, affecting society for the good and producing some sort of value. And that's better than the situation in the 19th century. But at the same time, this very right. pro is also perhaps leading to a kind of justification of something which we should not accept. Yeah, so this, this effort level kind of musks uh, the, the, the passive earnings. And, you know, there is also another element which I mentioned a couple of times in the book, but I think now that I should have actually um, emphasized it more. And I think this is this dynamic element. It is the, the fact that you have people who are rich both in terms of in capital and labor, and that they generally tend to partner together also. That's the part of the you know, uh, homogamy, uh, they are able to transfer to the next generation, to reproduce actually the, the, themselves actually in the next generation uh, uh, through different, I mean, by giving a huge amount of advantages that come first, obviously from inherited money, but also maybe more even importantly, ability to invest in schooling, in parental, you know, uh, sort of involvement and in making their children then also, uh, to some extent, risk resistant, because they're risk resistant in the sense that they have high capital income, uh, highly, uh, they're highly educated, or they come from schools that sort of give them an imprimatur that they have actually are very smart and hardworking. And then of course, through family connections in addition, they're able to get very well paying jobs. So dynamically, that that uh, uh, that combination of capital and labor and combination of marriage patterns leads to a very socially um, uh, sort of uh, gratified society. Yeah, yeah. So I think this dynamic element, which, as I said, I mentioned, I think now that I should have actually maybe uh, sort of emphasized more than I did in the book. Okay. Okay. So richer people have a have a different a safety net if you're to say. Um, I would like to uh, move on to pol political capitalism, as uh, we don't have a lot of time, unfortunately. Um, in your book, you mentioned several uh, characteristics, three actually. So um, the first is an efficient technocratic uh, bureaucracy. Uh, second, the absence of the rule of law. And third, the autonomy of the state over private interest. Um, you argue that these characteristics lead to two key contradictions in the system. Can you very briefly um, explain what these are? Well, the, the, the first contradiction is the contradiction between the need for an uh, efficient bureaucracy and the fact that there is no rule of law. Bureau uh, bureaucracy, as Weber said, actually would follow the rule of law, uh, uh, rules and the rule of law. But there is there cannot be a rule of law in a political capitalism because you need, the state needs to have the, the, the power uh, to actually reward people that they want to reward and also to punish economically people they want to punish. So discretionary power has to remain in the hands of the state. The second uh, contradiction is uh, really has to do with inequality. And you have actually the, the, uh, uh, the justification of the system which is based on performance and high growth rate, but that system, because of the arbitrary use of power, generates corruption. So corruption 
and corruption, which of course feeds into inequality. Corruption is then intrinsic characteristic of the system. So that's actually, I, I spent some time arguing that. I think we should not view uh, corruption at all as some anom anomaly, which happens in insistence of political capitalism, but you should see it as a component of that system. On this, on this corruption point, I think many in the, the West would say that there is definitely corruption in, in the liberal meritocratic system as well. We talked about you know, the effect right. of, of politics corrupting money. Is this kind of a key similarity between the systems or is actually the nature of this corruption, say, between the US and China fundamentally different? I think that the nature is, is, is different, uh, not the least because the uh, revelations of corruption in, uh, in liberal capitalism are easier to make than in the political capitalism because revelations of corruption in political capitalism immediately become perceived and probably rightly so as the attacks on the political system itself. So I think uh, the, and, and the nature, as you were saying, actually, is, is different because I would say that, uh, the, in the, as I said before, actually, in the political capitalism, that corruption goes through the political process being used in order to get economic gains. In the uh, liberal capitalism, it could be the reverse. But one thing which I think is, is very common to globalization and which I think is under research is the uh, uh, expansion of corruption going together with globalization. And I think that's the topic which has not been much researched, but it seems to me that because of the ability, uh, there are several reasons there, but I think including the ability to transfer the money, but also ideologically, the fact that we all now believe in being, well, basically to use Deng Xiaoping, it's being rich, it's, it's glorious. Uh, essentially, our value system is such that, that um, uh, corruption or any way of getting money is considered as acceptable so long as you're not being caught. But you actually, you, um, don't you argue that corruption should be seen as kind of a factor of, another factor of production? Um, yeah. Uh, it's it's not the I mean the factor of production in the same sense that I think capital and labor are because you can actually argue that it is a rent which is unnecessary to bring forth the product. But I think it's actually if we do it it's simply in an accounting sense, I believe that the size of corruption is, has increased. It has become to some extent accepted, or it's actually as I said before for political capitalism systemic. It is to some extent also systemic for the liberal capitalism. So actually, I think we should uh, go away from that uh, uh, moralistic approach. And if we really want to, to essentially look at the accounting part of, of one's income, we should actually put corruption there as well as a rent. OK. And excuse me, as you said, um, with, with political capitalism and liberal meritocratic, the, the corruption is kind of, they, they reverse each other. So um, one's politics first in, in China versus the US where it's, it's more economic, um, at least and then brings political power. But they both kind of have the same effect at the end of the day of increasing inequality. Uh, and so talking about inequality in, in China, we know that, well, we know that China's growth is very much connected to, to inequality in the West. And this is what your, your elephant curve uh, showed. But what's, what's been the story of inequality in, in political capitalist countries, specifically China, over the same time period? You know, in China, we have, I mean, we have the reasonable data, but we do have significant also problems compared to the fairly plentiful data that we have for the U.S. and uh, many other, you know, advanced countries. Uh, if you ask, like, for example, what is the evolution of Chinese inequality, it's very clear that in inequality in China really increased from the late 70s and throughout the 1980s and the 90s and so on, until probably around the early 2000s. So you basically have very significant increases. And of course, people should know that today's inequality in China is greater than inequality in the US. So if you t simply take the Gini coefficient in China, it is higher than the Gini coefficient in the US. Uh, however, uh, uh, according to the official data, we have had a basically stability in the overall inequality from around 2003 approximately. And that actually is being confirmed by several other observations, including 
that urban inequality, which is really sort of a dominant force there, simply because urban inequality was uh, increased very substantially, and secondly, because the urbanization of China is still proceeding, so you have more and more people who, are, who live in the urban areas. So we also noticed that urban inequality has not risen in the last 15 years. And finally, we noticed that, <coughs> excuse me, we noticed that the, the, the wage differentials between skilled and unskilled labor have been rather stable or actually decreasing. Because China has clearly come to a situation where the growth with what used to be called with sort of infinite supplies of labor at a given wage rate <coughs> has stopped. So, you so, this, this so these are the elements to, to argue that actually inequality in China being very high is no longer increasing. However, Chinese inequality, I have to mention that, is different in the sense that if you look at the regional composition of uh, inequality in China, it is really driven by that, as, as we know, the, the areas which are uh, the, the uh, maritime provinces, which are actually the Pacific provinces, are much richer than inland. So the, the gaps between provincial incomes are way greater than the gaps between state, uh, in the, take the example of the United States, state uh, differentials between different states, like Massachusetts, California, yeah. uh, Louisiana, in the US. So the, the structure of inequality in China is different. Okay, so uh, inequality is not no longer really increasing in China. This is um, this was very increasing through urbanization with with a finite but there was a finite supply of labor, um, and now we see inequality between um, a skills premium. But there is like the skills premium is bounded. The level of education is is bounded. Um, and this, this, this urbanization seems to be part of a trend of, of development, the particular development stage that China is in. Um, will we see over, over a couple of years, decades, I, I don't know exactly how, how long, uh, that when China will reach a certain development stage that they will have the same systemic features uh, as we now have in liberal meritocratic capitalism? Well, you know, the part of my argument was based precisely on uh, not agreeing with the, the view that was very prominent in the 1990s, you know, simplified, uh, to simplify that view, like uh, just to use Fukuyama's uh, belief that, um, that eventually uh, all societies will tend to combine the two features in the political uh, system that they will be liberal democracies and the economic system they will be capitalist. Uh, when we observe the world today, we indeed, as I was saying before and arguing before, we uh, we do notice that actually capitalism has become a unifying theme you know, of, of the world. But in the political space, we don't have uh, identical uh, regimes. And I don't think that there is an automatic movement towards sort of a same regimes across the world. I think that the, the, the conditions, uh, historical conditions, are very different and then um, the, the approach, individual approach towards power is very different. So I, I don't believe that we have an automatic uh, uh, sort of, how should I say, unification or uh, of political regimes to, to expect. Rather, if the last 20 years have actually rather shown the reverse, that actually we have much greater diversity of political systems now than we seem to have had in, in let's suppose, 1995. There's no sociological movement towards this utopia or Jerusalem. Um, but is that, that's what, you, what you're saying, right? Yeah, I, I, you know, I am somewhat maybe more of a, how should I say, economic determinist. Let me just uh, invert the, uh, the argument. Let me ask this. Let's suppose that uh, uh, socialists or come. I'm sorry, we uh, cannot. High, substantially higher sorry, rates of me, growth we, we than really. capitalist regimes. And let's suppose that they were they didn't have the disadvantage of having actually been uh, originally introduced in, in poorer countries. The very fact that people from those regimes and countries would be uh, richer 
that they would actually uh, purchase goods that you cannot afford, that they would travel to some nice vacation resorts that you cannot afford, would actually make people wish that they lived in such a system because they would be richer. So what I want to say by that, and that's what my sort of take also on so-called uh, East European revolutions, these were not revolutions of democracy. They were revolutions of uh, where democracy was a useful tool to sort of package them. They had two components, which was really uh, uh, revolutions which are driven by desire for greater wealth, because capitalism was clearly able to produce greater wealth. And secondly, of course, there were also nationalist revolutions because many of those countries were per perceived themselves or were under very strong Russian or Soviet uh, sort of control. Uh, so if you think of this, as I said, and that counterfactual, that answers a little bit the question that you asked. So if people from political capitalism become much richer and they do much better in 50 years, then there will be a pressure of so-called democracies to become political capitalists. So th this is why I am not convinced at all that we were actually have always to have to live under one system and that system would be liberal capitalism. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I want to relate it more to like what we're seeing right now over the last uh, couple of decades, we've really seen China entering uh, the, the global stage, uh, politically speaking, but also economically. Um, and its its influence has been reaching far into the West, uh, the US, Europe, but even more so in, in Asia itself, Latin America uh, and Africa uh, through the Belt and Road Initiative. Do you expect many countries in those regions to adopt this, this Chinese or, or, or political capitalism uh, model? Yeah, this is a very kind of a very difficult and uh, question, and I try to to kind of discuss that in the book because um, the adoption of the model has two components. First, you want first you have to be to want to sell your model, and secondly, somebody has to buy this model. And we have, in the case of China specifically, we have ambivalence in both. First, China historically was not very keen on selling its model. We know that historically, yeah. I mean, even simply if you compare the Chinese uh, um, maritime expeditions which took place before Columbus and were actually much greater, these were very different. Uh, they have very different objectives from the Europeans. <clears throat> so historically, China did not really project its own system very much outside of China. Uh, secondly, the, the Chinese system has the disadvantage compared to the liberal capitalism that it's actually built out of a, you know trial and error. So in other words, it is not something which is as clearly packaged and identifiable as liberal capitalism, where you say, okay, you have multi-party system, you have elections, you have the, whoever wins most votes you know, rules for a limited period of time. So it's a very simple package system. China doesn't have that. And then it's not obviously clear that other people would like to take the Chinese system. So it has all these disadvantages. Having said all of that, we do observe that actually a number of countries display for whatever reason, uh, features that are not dissimilar from, I mean, I actually part of political capitalism. I, I mentioned quite a few of them, um, you know, in, in uh, Africa, I think the most important one was Ethiopia, and it's still Ethiopia, which actually has really very strong features that match the, I mean, Chinese features, including, of course, having had a very high rate of growth over like 25 years. Now, um, uh, you know, as we know, Ethiopia is in trouble with possibility of a civil war. So that's a, a separate issue. But but, is, is that a separate issue? Because isn't if Ethiopia has had this growth over the past X number of years, past decades, and we still see the, the violence there, does that show that actually um, the demand for a system that is very good at delivering growth but falls short on legitimacy aspects is not going to be as popular or take hold to the extent that it has in China? You know, I, I'm not, of course, an expert on Ethiopia, but one thing which actually I find quite scary about Ethiopia is that the, the, the structural political 
uh, uh, the political structure of Ethiopia is very similar to the Soviet Union, to Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, all three countries that have broken apart. And actually, Ethiopia has already broken apart because of Eritrea's secession to start with. And, uh, uh, you know, it seems that these systems of, uh, so we are talking now about political parts of really, we are talking beyond what the book does. Uh, but it, it seems to me that the systems that are built on this ethnic federalism have somehow inbuilt tendency to basically break up. And that's what I find actually quite uh, uh, scary in the case of Ethiopia. Uh, I want also to mention that technically speaking, China was never a federation uh, and is not a federation. So it does not have the same setup that, uh, that Ethiopia does. Um, in, the, in the book, you seem to discuss solutions only really with regards to, to liberal meritocratic capitalism. So does this reflect the, reflect the belief that for you, the countries that you wish or you think, um, sorry, the system that you think countries should be adopting over the next century in this kind of battle between the two types of capitalism, if it pans out like that, is the liberal meritocratic option the best one for, for us or as a kind of personal normative stance? You know, you know, liberal meritocratic capitalism has the advantage of democracy. So to the extent that you view democracy as a value in itself, it is actually superior. If you view democracy as a tool towards greater wealth, then the question is asked differently. Is democracy the best tool for you to become richer and your society to become richer, or it is not? And that's why you have, I think, this competition between the two systems, because it could be that in some area, and actually in some cases, and in some countries, and some places, that political capitalism outperforms liberal capitalism. Uh, it's also the case, I think, historically, that the countries that have been the most successful economically over the long term have tended either to export their model or to be emulated and imitated by others. So it is, I don't think it's an accident that we had, of course, a, a, a sort of British system being uh, sort of emulated or imposed elsewhere because of Britain being the most powerful country and then the US system. So it, it is not uh, sort of uh, weird to think that if China had had the, the best performance over the last half a century, and if it will continue to have a best performance over another half a century, that many people would actually would like to copy the system. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, as I, as I said before, I'm uh, not, at, I'm, I tend to view democracy as a tool, not as a value, I mean, primarily as a value by itself. Okay, thank you. Um, we would like to come to an end of the interview uh, as we've taken an hour for this discussion, which uh, we both really enjoyed. Um, I mean, we don't want to end the interview, but yeah. we have to. <laughs> <laughs> we have some angry faces uh, after behind the camera. So, uh, um, you, you said in this interview that you are quite optimistic about the future. Uh, to me and or, or us, it kind of seemed, reading this book and reading the research, that there is this equilibrium of, 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 of wealth and of poverty. Um, do you think this, this equilibrium is there or are you still optimistic about what the, the future of mankind holds in store for us? Well, I think I was, I was uh, saying uh, that I'm optimistic in the sense of, uh, I think that question was raised and I think I, I might have mentioned it in the book, in the, in the ability, on our ability to solve, for example, things like climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, technically, through the use of traditional, to some extent, mechanisms of uh, uh, taxation or subsidization of, uh, you know, obviously taxation of bad activities, quote unquote, and subsidization of good activities. And of course, changes in behavior, which would be also driven by, uh, you know, economic motivation, economic interest. So in that sense, I was optimistic. I was also optimistic in our um, ability uh, as I said, our meaning the entire society, the world, ability to deal with technological revolutions, with automation, with uh, uh, robotics. I, I don't think that they would actually make uh, work obsolete. I don't think that they are 
a bad thing. I actually believe that we have had two centuries of experience of introduction of technological change and machinery, which does actually affect certain groups of people, uh, but on balance actually makes lives of others and, you know, better. So these are the two areas where I would say I'm, I'm a sort of a technological optimist. Mm -hmm. um, but um, when it comes to the competition between the two systems, as I said before, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, dogmatically viewing the advantages of one or actually that I don't believe that we will see the uh, domination of one over the other. You will live in a bipolar world. Sort of, yes, okay. sort of bipolar world, which may not be, let me just say that. And actually, if you look at the book, and I think that there is in the like, first page, there is a very long <clears throat> quote from Adam Smith, which basically says that, and actually it's an extremely precise quote, where he sees that equalization of economic conditions across the world and equalization of military power, because the military power is derived from from economic conditions is a precondition for a peaceful world. Mm -hmm. So actually this is a very long citation and uh, there, is very, there is no doubt about the interpretation is that interpretation is really equality of economic and political power and to some extent equality, I mean, uh, a balance of power globally is a precondition for a peaceful world. And um, I, I believe that actually in that sense, uh, 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 having multipolar world or having uh, sort of different models is also uh, good for peace. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Milanovic. I really enjoyed this. Um, I hope you did so too. Um, we have a message to our audience on, on Thursday, uh, one o'clock, we will be interviewing uh, Sergei Guriev. Uh, former economic advisor to Medvedev, the, the former Russian uh, president. Um, and the week after that, we will do a discussion on uh, the progressiveness or the lack of that in the Dutch art world. Um, I really hope you all enjoyed this interview uh, as much as we did. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Milanovic. Thanks uh, very much. It was thank very you. nice well, having you here. Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. It was really very nice to discuss all these topics with you. And um, appreciate your invitation. Yeah, uh, can we, one, one last question actually, uh, because we really liked your book, Capitalism Alone, and I actually recommended it to a lot of people, but you said you were writing a new book. Do you already, like, have, are you writing this? Well, well, the idea there where I actually started with, I wanted to look at how, how uh, I started with Kene, and then Kene, Smith, Ricard, and Marx, how do they actually think of inequality? If you look at each of them, there is no, actually the word even inequality does not appear very often. And their thinking of inequality, as I mentioned a little bit in our conversation, is of course through the functional inequality. So I wanted actually to tease out how their thinking of inequality was influenced by inequalities which they observe in their own time, which of course was different from today's, and how we can translate it. So that was the idea. It's still the idea of the book, and but I was told that, that uh, I should really push it more towards the present. So I will probably do that, although that makes it much more difficult to write because obviously the number of authors, uh, you know, work is, is becomes yeah. enormous in the last uh, century. Um, so so that's the idea. It's actually to to look at. Um, to some extent, an intellectual history of um, of thinking about inequality. So that yeah, was, the for, a, for an economist, it seems like you, well, I mean, I don't want to make generalizations about economists, but you do seem to, to look at kind of historical thinkers and, and stuff quite a lot, maybe more than your average. Um, yes, you know, yes, I, I would say more than an average, definitely, because I think that the average uh, would, be, would be relatively uh, uninterested. But uh, I think it is also changing. I think that we are moving away from uh, sort of only obsession with the, with the last uh, you know, couple of years in terms of writing. I think actually we are really, I think because some of the fundamental issues of capitalism have been raised really in a very similar uh, way by all these classical authors. And I think because we are going through a process, through a period which actually we are re-raising these issues 
because now we are re-raising them in a globe on a global scale. I think these authors, I believe now, are to us much more, I believe, much more relevant than the authors in between. I was talking 1960 to 2000. Okay. So that's why I think we are really, I hope actually, rediscovering the um, people, you know, of classical economics. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. We are really looking forward to this uh, book, and we will definitely use it. You're going to take some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank, you thank, thank, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Lamarch.